if you can, right? You got a left leg? Pick up that left leg and step it up and step it in. Come on now. Let's try that again now. Y'all look like a bunch of senior citizens up in here. Come on. You ready? Step it up. And step it in, right? That's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to talk about stepping up and stepping in. All right, y'all have a seat. Y'all have a seat. That's what we're going to do tonight. Hey, before I get started, man, some, hey, who needs a nice new Bible? Because somebody left their nice new Bible here. I guess you don't want it. Now, look at this beauty right here. Whose is that? Anybody have a name? I mean, anyone have a, have a claim to this? It's an NLT, man. It's like brand. I don't think anyone's ever opened it. You better not claim it as yours, right? Is it yours? Whose is it? On what table? My table? Oh, that's a real nice Bible. Who wants a new, brand new, New Living Translation Bible? Anybody? My stepping up and stepping in, man. Woo! There we go. Yeah. Hey, careful, that thing. It's sharp. It's a sharp sword. You cut your finger on it. Careful now. Awesome. Well, I'm gl so glad to be here tonight, and uh, we are being joined, I know, by some folks online, and we're so happy that they're here to join us. It's always the best to join us in person, amen? But if you can't make it for some reason, slackers, I mean, um, if you can't make it and you're, like, living out of town or something, you can join us on Facebook. So hello to everybody on Facebook watching, and um, I want to say hello to, I know our, our friends the Strickland's up in South Carolina, they're watching, and the Cates family uh, up in Michigan, and they're watching, and I think Linda and Roger Baker up in Pennsylvania are watching, and I don't know who else is watching, but hello to whoever's watching. We're glad that you're here, and uh, man, we're excited. I'm excited to jump into God's Word tonight. Y'all excited? Awesome. That's the, that's the main dish, right? So... Um, so we've been studying through the, the, this, this, this book called Philemon. I call it Philemon. Y'all can call it whatever you want. His name is Phil in this church. We're a non-denominational church. We don't fight over stupid stuff. We just want to know what's in the book. We don't care what the guy's name was Philemon, Philemon, Philip, Felipe. It doesn't make any difference. We just want to know what we can learn. I want to learn something, right? I don't know if you guys have been learning anything through this study, but I've been, I've been learning as I'm studying and preparing to come and share God's word with you. In this message series called Authentic. Y'all didn't get that, did you? Yeah, I, was, I think my wife just left the room. That was for her. Oh, my goodness. All right, if y'all were here last week, you know what I'm talking about. Love my wife. Love my wife. Get real. We want to get real. We want to know what a real Christian is so we can know how to live, right? God said he wants to. Oh, there's my baby. Hey, hey, I love you. So, so uh, he, wants us to, he wants us to worship him in spirit and in truth, right? You can get excited, like the spirit thing, we can get excited about all that, but we want to get excited about the right thing, right? So that's why we study the scriptures, so we can understand who God really is, and we can find out what it says in his word about how he wants to be worshipped. Do you know that he don't care what you think about how he should be worshipped? He's not the least bit concerned about that. He's concerned about you worshipping him the way he wants to be worshipped. That's real worship. So, so we've been studying through this, this book called Philemon. We'll call him Phil, right? And uh, we've been studying that because we want to know what a real Christian looks like. We don't want to be like them knuckleheads like the KKK who say they're Christians and then act all stupid, right? That's not what we want to be, right? So we want to be authentic. We want to be real. And so we studied the first week. We talked about how a real Christian engages, that they speak up, that they, that they, they engage people because they know the truth of God's word. And when you love somebody, you engage in their life. You don't just sit back and relax and watch them head right for the cliff and I'm going to fall off and I'm going to crash. Would you save me, please? I'm going to fall. Would you just save me? And you're sitting over there eating your Doritos and you let them crash. When all the while you saw something in their life and you could just go up to them and give them a chapter and a verse and it could have saved them the trouble, but you didn't. And so we're real Christians. We want to engage in people's lives. Don't be quiet, y'all. I'm trying to practice that right now. Don't be quiet. So we learn that a real Christian engages and speaks up. We also learn that a, that a real Christian obeys spiritual authority. And, and why is that? Is it because the pastor's so cool and he's so smart? We all know that's not the case in your church. We, the reason why you obey spiritual authority is because the scripture says that he has placed you under that authority. 
That's why. That's what qualifies the preacher, is that he has put you into that flock. He's entr- it says he has entrusted you into the care of that shepherd. And so if we want to obey God, you obey spiritual leadership. And it says that they're supposed to submit and obey to their leadership because if not, it's not going to work out good for you. So we're supposed to obey spiritual authority. And the other thing is, listen, I, and I, I said this last week, but I, I just want to tell you, I actually said it two weeks straight because it's a big deal. Like one day I have to look into the eyes of Jesus and give an account for your soul. Do you have to do that for me? Say, no, you don't. No, you have to do it for you. And I have to do it for you, too. If God called you into this church, and I believe more and more all the time that he does the calling and you do the obeying. And then he calls you into a church to be a part of that expression. And he is, so that means he has put you under the care of somebody. And one of these days, that person has to give an account for your soul. It's who you are, your soul wrapped up in a body. And one of these days, you're going to go stand before the Lord. And I'm going to stand before the Lord. And I have to give an account for you and me. And I want that to be a good day, y'all. So please help a, help a brother out. So the third thing we studied last week was that a real Christian is authentic. And I didn't use that, that graphic because it's sort of redundant, isn't it? Shouldn't a real Christian be authentic? Shouldn't a Christian and authentic be the same word? What did we learn last week? With that, that, that what the truth is found in this book and what you believe and what you teach and what you practice and display should all be the same. There should be what? No gap. Remember? That's what a real Christian is. But tonight, we're going to progress. Anyone want to progress? I want to progress. I want to learn. I want to grow. I want to become more like Jesus. Remember what it says? We behold his glory, full glory, with veil, veil faces un, unveiled. And, and, and we want to move towards that. And what God is going to do is he's going to move us to that one level of glory to another. And so that's what we're here to do tonight, to become a little bit more like Jesus. So we're going to step up and we're going to step in. That's the title of our message. And where we get that is from verse 18 and 19 of Philemon. So let me just give you the backstory so we don't read the whole book again. So, so here's this guy, Paul. He's writing a letter to this guy, Philemon, who's the pastor of a, of a house church. And in, in this house church, I don't know how many people go there, but it's in Colossae which is in, like, modern-day Turkey, Asia Minor area. And, and so they meet in this house, and there's, a, there's some other people there, Afia and Archippus, and they all meet in this home. And Paul writes a letter to these people about this guy Onesimus, who apparently was the slave of Philemon. That Philemon is this wealthy pastor. He has got a big footprint on his city. He's important. And this guy, Onesimus, has, was his slave, and he stole something from him, and then he ran away, and he got caught, and as fate would have it, he gets thrown in prison next to the Apostle Paul. So what do you think is going to happen to that guy, right? He's getting saved. Whether he wants to or not, he's getting saved, right? And so he gets saved. And so, so Paul writes him back, writes to Philemon, says, hey, listen, Phil, I met this guy you know, and, and, and he was a slave, and he, must, he meant nothing to you then, but now he's a brother, and, and, and now he's going to be important to you because he's not just a slave, he's actually your brother in Christ, and so I want you to welcome him back as you would if I was coming to visit you. And y'all admitted that if the Apostle Paul was coming to your house, you'd fluff his pillows and leave a mint and clean the house a little bit better than you normally would. So he thought that that's the way your house looked all the time. And so he's saying, listen, I want you to do the same thing for this guy that you used to hate, that you thought was worthless, but the gospel changes things. And because of the gospel, he is no longer just a slave. He's on equal ground with you. He's a brother in the Lord. And I want you to welcome him back. That's the story. And in verse 18 and verse 19, he says, listen, if he, has, if he has taken anything from you, if he owes you anything, I, Paul, will pay it back. He's like, I don't always write my letters myself, you know. Did you know that Paul didn't always write his own letters, right? It's, it, it's, it's, he's the author. Who's the author, really? Come on. Right, right, right. So, so but, but, but God uses Paul to, to, like, jot this stuff down, but he doesn't even do the jotting. He got a good job, right? He doesn't have to write. He doesn't have to think of anything. He just has to stand there and let God download into him. 
And, and so they used what they call an amanuensis. He was like a secretary, and he would write down what, the, what Paul would write, would say, dictate to him. But in this case, he's like, listen, I just, just to make sure, I want to make sure that you know, like, this is me writing this, y'all. I am going to pay you back. If he owes you anything, I, Paul, will pay it back. That's called stepping up and stepping in. This is Paul stepping into a situation that most of us, we talked about this week one, most of us will avoid. Because we don't want to make you mad because you have a nice boat and we go out fishing on Sundays, and I don't want to mess that up. So I don't want to confront you with anything because if I confront you, you might stop inviting me to go fishing, right? And Paul and Philemon are buddies, co-laborers, fellow soldiers, beloved brothers, right? They're co-workers in the faith, and he's got a good thing going with this guy. And he's got a good thing going with Onesimus. Paul has got, he's buddies with both of them. But they're not together anymore. The slave owner and the slave have parted ways. And Paul's like, listen, I'm friends with two Christian brothers. Maybe you guys can relate. I'm friends with two Christian brothers or two Christian sisters. I'm friends with you, and I'm friends with you, but y'all don't get along. What are we going to do? Do anyone have any of that situation before? What do we do with that? Paul says, step up and step in. Don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid. Don't be politically correct. Step in and engage in the situation. And that's what this is all about. I, Paul, will pay it for him. Last week I talked about Jesus' yoke. You guys remember the yoke? Over in Matthew 11, I think it is. He, Jesus says, hey, yo, 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 who, if, you're, if you're tired and weary, come to me if you have heavy burdens, and I'll give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Remember we talked about that? Do you guys remember that? Okay. So you're not just standing there. You're actually paying attention? Okay. So, so, so he says, my burden, if you have a heavy burden, I want you to join my yoke because my burden is light. But y'all admitted that, that Jesus is spinning planets on his fingers right now, right? See, you think you got a big problem with your life. You got issues. Man, I got issues. I got stuff. I hate when people say that. I'm just dealing with some stuff. What stuff you got? How about Jesus' stuff? He's got to deal with you. And, and, and did you ever notice that all this time, I don't know how many years really the earth has been going. Like, people argue about that. I don't know how many years, but would you just say it's a long time? Why is it that if the, if the universe is filled with trillions, trillions of big rocks and planets and moon and stars and Saturn, all this stuff all around, why isn't anything hitting us? Because in Christ, all things are held together. That's why. You don't think his burden is heavy? He's got a huge heavy burden, but because of who he is, his burden compared to him is very, very nothing. He's like, I'm taking care of the universe, man. And you got to, you, you're afraid because your car payment's due? Come on. Listen, I, I, I'm taking care of the whole universe, so why don't you, with your big problem, why don't you come over here and hook into my yoke, and I'll carry that little thing that you think is so big. I won't even feel it. Come on. That's what he said to do, right? But listen, sometimes yoking to him means yoking to his. This is where the rubber meets the road, right? It's easy to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to yoke up to the king of the universe because he, he spins Jupiter on his finger like no big deal. But, but, I, but I, listen, to yoke with him means to yoke with his. That's what we're talking about, right? Let me explain this clearly. This is the way we're going to explain that. We'll take you to two places. We're going to go super, super high, way up here, right? And we're going to look at him. High and holy, lifted up. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. They're way up here, right? So we're going to look at him first. We're going to look at him, Jesus. And then we're going to go down low to the his, right here, us, into the dirt, down low in the everyday moments of life, right? His, me and you, right? That's what we're going to do. Okay, so let's talk about Jesus first, right? I just figured that we could... I didn't think you guys would mind that, being that we're a, a church that's, that's for God and through God and to the glory of God, that we could talk about Jesus for a few minutes. Would that be okay? Okay, just making sure. I just want to make sure. I don't want to offend anybody. Y'all know me, right? So, so listen, there's a lot to learn about Jesus. 
And, and we're going to spend a lifetime, hopefully, together, right, in community, learning to know him better. I want to understand who Jesus is. You all want to do that? I want to do that. And if we spent a million years together, we still couldn't even scratch the surface of who he is. The Bible says that, 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 the, that the known universe that blows your mind is the fringes of his robe. One little piece of string hanging off his shirt. That's what the known universe is. So we can spend a lifetime investigating the person of Jesus, and we'll never find out everything about him. We can find out about his holiness, and we should learn about his love, and we should learn about his wrath, and we should learn about his laws. We should learn about everything there is to know about him. But there's two words I want to give you tonight. This is something you have to understand. you got to get this. It's two words. It's substitutionary atonement. That sounds all churchy, but we're going to break it down. I know it sounds terrible. So listen, since you guys are not a churchy bunch, you're just regular folks like you and I, let's just give you a different way to say substitutionary atonement. It's this. Jesus Christ on my cross. That's what that is. Jesus Christ on my cross. The Bible says this, and you guys probably all know it, that we all sin and fall short of God's perfect standard. Every single person since Adam and Eve's stupid fall in the garden, we're all born with this inclination to sin. And not only does the Bible teach that, but our life testifies to that. Come on, right? How many people in this room would agree that it's really, sin comes easy? Come on, raise your hand, right? It's easy to sin. And listen, I just want to say this. God, when I start talking about sin, people are like, oh, God doesn't want to. Let me have any fun, you know, and, and he's a cosmic buzzkill in the sky, and he don't want me to. Listen, God doesn't want you to not have any fun. He doesn't want you to not have any pleasure. It, it's just that certain things that you do, there's, cert, like, there's certain things that you could do that bring great pleasure to you, to everybody, and to God. But there's certain things, they do bring pleasure to you. But that's not what God wants. And so it's not the pleasure that's the problem. The problem is the penalty. The problem isn't the pleasure, right? It's the penalty. It's the penalty that's involved with some of the pleasures that you're seeking after. See, the problem is that since all of us fall short of God's standards, not my standards, my standards don't mean anything. Your standards mean nothing. Since we all fall short of God's standard, then we are subject to God's verdict and therefore subject to God's penalty. So here's how it works. God has standards, right? Y'all have one of these? You have a Bible, right? I hope you have a Bible. I hope it's open to Philemon. But all, all of us have this Bible. Inside this Bible, is, it's all filled with thou shalt and thou shalt not, right? It's filled with all these standards. The Bible's filled with them. But just for ease of understanding, let's just, let's just talk about his top ten. You guys know the top ten, right? The Ten Commandments. Do I have it up there? Can you put it up on the screen? Did I put that in there? No, it's not in there? Okay, so we know the, to the Ten Commandments. So how about this? Thou shalt not lie. How about not murder? How about but no gods before me? Like, I'm the only God, only worship me. Make no idols. Make no, don't, don't take a piece of rock or a piece of wood or a piece of paper or whatever, and don't make it into something and bow down before it. Don't give of your resources crazy to something other than me. Y'all agree with these things? Now let me ask you a question. Is it better, are we going to get along good if I lie to you all the time? How about, it, um, pa Patty, how about if I kill you? We're we going to get along well if I try to kill you? Probably not, right? How about, if I, how about if you covet my stuff? How about if you're, like, lusting after my, my wife? Like, it's not going to go well, right? So why did God give us these commandments? Is it for human flourishing? I mean, we're going to get along better if we don't do this stuff, right? So would you agree that it's for human flourishing? I, I, I agree, but I think it's just a byproduct. 
That's really not why God gave us the Ten Commandments. If we, if we keep them, we're going to get along well. Wouldn't you agree? But that's not the reason why he gave it to us. So he tells us in Romans 3.19 why he gave us these rules. He gives two reasons. And one of them is not for human flourishing. That's why I say it's a byproduct. We all agree that if we don't steal each other's stuff and don't lie to each other, and don't kill each other, we're going to get along good. So we know it's for human flourishing, but that's not one of the reasons. He says that he gave us the law to show that the entire world is guilty before God. The entire world, y'all. How many people does that exclude? I'm probably going to scare people away from the church right here, right now, but I'm going to be faithful to the word of God no matter what you think. That means every man, woman, and child who ever lived and ever will. And if you have a problem with that, you take it up with the word all. The entire world is guilty before God. Listen, y'all agree with, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, right? That whoever, look, man, woman, or child, no matter where they, who they are, where they live, if they say yes to Jesus, that they're going to be in glory. You all agree with that, right? If you agree that, that God so loved the world, then you need to understand that the whole world, same word, is guilty before God. It doesn't mean babies are excluded because they haven't been naughty yet because they didn't know any better. The entire world is guilty. Listen, I'm telling you that not to make you like disgusted with me, but to light a fire under your keister to evangelize the world because they need to hear the gospel. There's only one way in, and it's not out of ignorance that you get in. You get in by saying yes to Jesus Christ and that alone. And so we need to get going and tell the world about him. You see, Everyone in the world is guilty. So the verdict is given, guilty. And the penalty is declared, Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death. It's death. The payment's due, isn't it? If you sin, something has to die. That's the penalty. The penalty is required. So here's what it means. Here's what I mean by that. Hebrews 9, 22 says this, that without the shedding of blood... There's no forgiveness of sin. Remember the death penalty, right? Something has to bleed. Something has to die. Only because God is just. Would you really think, like, that's tough, right? That's tough to say, well, so something has to die just because they sinned? Let me ask you a question. Would you really like this God? Would you want to worship him if he let all the bad people get away with it and never have to pay for it? Would you want to bring your case to a judge that always let the guilty people off with no punishment at all? No, he's a just God. That's who he is. And so when he says that something has to bleed, something has to die, it's okay because he's the authority of the universe. It's his universe. It's his decision. They're his standards. We're his people. It's his law. It's his penalty. It's his blood. He made all the blood in the people. He made all the blood in the animals. He owns it all, right? He determines what you got to do. So watch this. Because of sin... Every single person is guilty. That's what the Bible says, right? Every single person. So, so your soul, the thing that you are, has a stamp on it, right? The verdict has been given. What does it say? Guilty. Every single soul says guilty on it. So <laughs> what do we do about that? What are you going to do about that problem? Well, this is not a new problem, man. This problem has been going on for a long, long time. I don't even know how many, how, anyone in this room know when Leviticus was written? Say a long time ago. <laughs> right. Leviticus, right? We're not, let's just not talk about Jesus for a second. But in Leviticus, I think it's in, in, in chapter 17, verse 11, it says this, right? See, I, <laughs> let, let me tell you something. Let me give you a little background here before I get into, into Leviticus. I'm Jewish, and so I grew up in a, in a, in a Jewish home. And so I, 
you know, with a name like Moses, I didn't, I guess you probably didn't have to really think too hard about that one. So, and the nose maybe gave it away. So, 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 so I, I, I grew up in a Jewish home and, and, and so we, you know, I got bar mitzvahed and I went to, to Hebrew school and we went to the temple during the holidays and all that kind of good stuff. And, and I, we, we went to temple on Saturday and we celebrated the Sabbath and all that stuff. And one of the things that we did is we kept a kosher home. We kept a kosher home. So the kosher thing is, is these dietary laws that God gave for his people. You're supposed to keep them, right? So that's what my, my parents did that. But, you know, um, I was kind of ignorant to the whole Jewish religion. How many people followed a religion, whether it be Jewish, Christian, Catholic, whatever, because your parents made you, but you had no idea what you were doing? Look at it. Almost everybody in the room. Well, that was me. I'm part of you. And I, and I, and I went and I, and I ate all this. Listen, I didn't get to eat a cheeseburger until I was 16. <clears throat> That's blasphemy. I didn't eat a cheeseburger until I was like 16, 17 years old. I didn't eat bacon. Someone feel bad for me. I didn't eat shrimp. Because I thought, and my parents thought, that just God didn't want you to eat that stuff. That's not the case. You know, they say that you can't mix milk and meat together. That was one of the dietary laws. Well, that's really nice. Except that's not the law either. The law was you can't cook goat meat in its mother's milk. Right? So milk and meat. You, you can see the connection that they made. They said, listen, here's God's standard right here. And because we're high and holy, we're not going to get anywhere near that standard. So we're going to keep it all the way back here. So we didn't even get close to it. So you can't eat milk and meat together. So here again, right, these dietary laws. I thought we weren't supposed to eat anything from a pig. We can't eat milk and meat together. We can't, all, can't do all this stuff. Like, you know what my mom used to do? She used to take meat and put salt all over it before she cooked it to draw out all the blood. Now, let me be honest with you. Let me ask you a question. How many people in here like a raw, just red, yummy steak, right? Mmm. Mm, just, I just want to see where the jockey was hitting it, right? Yeah, man, just, just, just raw, red. I love that. But see, back then God said, you can't eat that. It wasn't because it was bad for you or nothing. Listen, Leviticus 17, 11, God tells us that the life of a creature is in the blood. So don't eat the blood, for I have appointed it for you to make atonement on the altar for your soul. That's why you don't eat the blood. It's not that the blood is bad. The blood is good. The blood, but the blood had been appointed by God for a different purpose. It wasn't so you could eat a nice, juicy, rare steak. It's because you need to take this blood. Don't use it for you. Give it to me. He said, I have appointed this blood to make an atonement. That means to cleanse you. That means to pardon you from your sin. You know what that means, right? Like when the president pardons someone... It doesn't even matter if they were innocent or guilty. When he pardons them, they're innocent now. Whether they did it or not, the charge is dropped. You're pardoned. That's what atonement is. I have appointed the blood to be an atonement for the soul, for your sin, and to reconcile you. We'll talk about that in a second. Don't eat the blood, but use it to atone for your sin. Remember, Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness, there's no atonement, right? And so the Old Testament Jews were going around killing all kinds of animals, endlessly killing animals for the blood to appease God so that his wrath would not come upon them because he said, I need blood to make up for this. So he said, kill all these animals. So they're killing animal after animal, and they're bringing the blood to the high priest. And every single year, the high priest would take the blood, and he would go in to the mercy seat. He'd go to the Ark of the Covenant. You guys know what I'm talking about, the mercy seat? Y'all know what the mercy seat is? Some, is anybody in here not know what the mercy seat is? Raise your hand. Don't be ashamed. Anybody, okay, listen, put that up on the screen. Don't I have that up on the screen? There's the mercy seat. Okay, the Ark of the Covenant. You may have heard of that. 
The Ark of the Covenant was this box. It's made out, it's like layered in gold. It's real fancy. And it's got the angels on it and stuff like that. You weren't allowed to touch it. It was super holy. And if you, I don't know if you could see it, but on the bottom it has a list of the things that were in it. The Ten Commandments were in that thing. That's, that's important, right? The Ten Commandments was in it. There was pieces of manna. Remember, they were, they were out in the, in the desert, and they didn't have any food, and God provided manna from heaven, that, that, that mysterious food that came down. They saved some of that, and they put that in there. I hope they put it in a Ziploc bag because it usually goes bad in a day. And you know the rod that Moses was carrying around? That was in, like, this is an important thing. And so the mercy seat was the, bo- was the cover of the box. It was just the lid. It was the lid. You see the angels on it? And so every year the high priest would go in behind the, the curtain, like into this most holy place, and between the angel wings. See that yellow piece of cotton-looking thing right there? That's just the artist's attempt to try to show you that's the Shekinah glory of God. That's where, like, that's where he manifested himself. Like, God is everywhere. You all know that he's omnipresent, right? He's everywhere. He fills the universe with himself. But somehow, some way, he would show up in a powerful way and manifest himself right there between the wings of the angels. And that seat was called the mercy seat. And every year, the high priest would go in with the blood, and he'd, put the, he'd, he'd sprinkle the blood right on top of that box, right on the mercy seat. Every year. God's like... You bring the blood, and I'll bring the mercy. That's what happened there. Every year, for everyone, for all their sins, to appease this holy God, because something had to die for the sins of his people. And so every year, they would bring the blood, and he would bring the mercy. And the animals that were dying left and right, I wouldn't want to live back then. It's disgusting. They were killing animals left and right to bring these offerings of blood to the Lord. And, you know, these, 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 these animals used for blood atonement, they had to be perfect. That means they couldn't have blemishes, and they couldn't, have, they couldn't be, like, all busted up and broken, and, and they couldn't have flaws, they couldn't be deformed, you know. You didn't, bring your, 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 you didn't keep your good cow at home for the fillets and bring that limping cow in that has, like, three legs and the tail growing out of his head and bring in some lame offering to the Lord, although some of us do that when we bring our offering now. We don't, we don't bring our best, right? We don't bring our first fruits we bring our rotten fruit and put it in that basket because you wouldn't put it in your fruit basket in your house because that would stink, so you bring your junk. People do that all the time. But God's like, no, I don't want you to, to bring these rotten offerings. I want you to bring something perfect. Why perfect, right? And, and listen, don't, 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 don't not think about this. This is important. Why perfect? Shouldn't perfect tell you something about how important dealing with your sin is? Shouldn't bringing your best animal, like that's a big consequence. Like none of us in here are probably farmers. But if you were a farmer, wouldn't your most, wouldn't your best crop or your best animal be precious to you? The one that's got the leg growing out of the side of his head that won't bring anything at the market, he doesn't mean anything to you. So if you had to give that up, that'd be no big deal, right? But you don't want to give up your prized crop, your prized animal. And God's like, no, I want you to bring me your best. What does that mean? That means sin bugs him. Big time. And it should bother you. I think that's why he said, bring me something perfect. So maybe you'd stop. It should say something to you. This representation of perfection, this animal that is perfect, would be your substitute. It would be the substitute for the imperfect sinner. So the imperfect sinner would bring the perfect sacrifice to the mercy seat and ask for God's mercy. Are you ready for the gospel? Because here it comes. You will not leave this church tonight without hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. You might not hear anything else, but you're about to hear the gospel. So no one, no one will leave this place and say, I didn't know. Okay? Along comes Jesus. Stepping up 
and step it in, right? Here comes Jesus, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. There it is again, of the world. For God so loved the world, takes away the sin of the world. Did he take away everybody's sin? No, 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 no. It just means that it's available. See, see, Christianity, like the, the path is super, 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 super narrow. Nate, I can barely see you. The, the door is super narrow, but the invitation is massive. It's super wide. It's for all people, right? It's available for every single person. 2 Corinthians 5.21, man, this is, there's a, there's a, like, John 3.16 is the gospel, isn't it? God so loved the world, gave his only begotten son, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's a good one. I think this one's even better. That's just my perspective. 2 Corinthians 5.21, listen to this. He who knew no sin, what's that mean? He was perfect. Remember the, remember the offering had to be a perfect sacrifice. So he who knew no sin, in other words, he's the only person who ever lived that didn't have the stamp on him. He didn't have his soul stamped guilty at all, did he? He's the only one, the only one, because he didn't come from a human line. He came from the Holy Ghost, right? He came from heaven and came down. So he didn't, he wasn't born with the sin nature in his blood like from Adam and Eve like you and me. He came from heaven, so he was perfect, and not only did he have no sin injected into him at birth like we did, but he also never sinned while he was here. So he who knew no sin, perfect, became sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's the gospel. Listen, 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 listen. The perfect one became sin. How many people have heard that, that Jesus paid the price for your sin? Raise your hand. That's awesome, right? Can we give him a shout out for that? Come on now. Awesome, right? But it's so much better than that. That's like nothing. He didn't pay for your sin. He became sin, right? So what does that mean? That means God's, God's not looking at you trying to find sin in you anymore. Jesus is like, no, 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 no. Don't look at Tom anymore for your sin. Look at me. I'm sin. I'm guilty. I did it. That's what Jesus said. I did it. Not Tom. Not Susan. I did it. He who knew no sin became sin. So in him. You know, the Bible says that we're the body of Christ. Right? Anyone is in Christ. They're a new creation. The old has died. Behold, a new man. Any of us who are in him, because we're in him, in his body, part of his family, that we might become the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God. That's another churchy word. The righteousness of God. What does righteous mean? That's like good and always good and, and, and never bad and always proper and always perfect. That's righteousness, right? So how, how, what is God's righteousness like? It's like the one who became, the one who knew no sin, you said he was what? Perfect. What's God's righteousness? Perfect, right? Is his righteous? Is his is his goodness lacking in any way? Right? Is his honesty lacking in any way? Is his faithfulness lacking in any way? He's perfect, right? But it says right here, and sometimes you got to take what you think and what you feel and throw it on the back burner and take the, the word of God and accept it as truth. And it says that if you're in him, that you become the righteousness of God. The perfect one becomes flawed, so the flawed one can become perfect. That's us, man. That's the good news. I can't believe only one person's come. Not for me. Come on, look what he did for you. The blood reconciles. We sang the blood. A better word was spoken, nothing but the blood. The blood reconciles. It cleanses you. It pardons you of sin. And it reconciles. What does that mean? It reconciles. What, what did he do? He became sin so you might become the righteousness of God. He became sin. He paid your penalty. Why? So you could become the righteousness of God. He reconciled you. How did he, what did he reconcile? You know, the Bible says that you were once far away from God because you were dead in your sin. But that God reconciled you back to himself through the physical death of his son on the cross. 
And because of that, he's brought you into the throne room where God the Father is, holy and blameless and without a single flaw. That's perfect righteousness. We need to start thinking differently about ourselves. I'm guilty of this. I think I'm nothing and I suck. No, I'm the righteousness of God, right? The flawed one became, the, 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 the perfect one became flawed, so the flawed one could become perfect. I'm nothing special, but when Christ died for me and I said, yes, God looks at me as perfect. He doesn't need me to get any better. I need to get better so I can serve him more. But I don't need to get better in his eyes. He loves me with an everlasting love. He's looking at you right now like the cartoons when, they, when the person falls in love and his little heart's popping out of his eyes. That's the way God's looking at you right now. This is Jesus Christ on your cross. <laughs> you sin, and he says, no, 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 you didn't. I did. You deserve penalty. And Jesus is like, no, I do. So they don't have to. This is him stepping up and stepping in to your burden. That's substitutionary atonement. It's not the only way that the Bible talks about this. Here's another gospel presentation to you. So you can never say, I didn't know. 1 John 2, 2 says this. Jesus, here's another church word, is the propitiation for our sins. And not only our sins, but also for the whole world. There it is again. There it is again. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's the only true God. There's none that even live. There's none that need to be created. He's the God that covers the whole universe. We don't need any more gods. He's an all-sufficient Savior. He's it for every single person, every man, woman, and child who ever lived, ever will live. He is enough to cover all their sins. What in the world is propitiation? The word propitiation is only used three times in the Bible, twice in 1 John and once in Romans. It is a really neat word. It's a Greek word, hilasterion. I'm not smart. I'm just reading the, the way they pronounce it so you can read it. I don't read Greek. It's got two meanings. And it's the coolest, coolest word ever, man. <laughs> See, remember... Remember I said that every year you bring the blood and God brings the mercy, right? You bring the blood to his mercy seat. So you bring the blood and I'll bring the mercy to the party. That's the, that's, that's the agreement. Hilasterion, the propitiation, means the blood for the atonement and the mercy seat. So now, it used to be you bring the blood and I'll bring the mercy. Now he's like, no, I'll bring the blood and I'll bring the mercy. That's what propitiation is. Jesus steps up and steps into your burden, your greatest burden. Jesus Christ on your cross, substituting for your sin, absorbing your crimes against a holy and perfect God so that the perfect one becomes flawed, so the flawed ones can become perfect. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. I challenge you to compare that to any religion of the world that says, you got to pay. What deity says, no, I'll pay for the crime against me? One loves you. Nobody else does this. Now that alone should get some members up in here, right? Come on. Okay, so we went up high, and we looked at him. This is what he did, right? This is what he did. But now we want to go down low to, to us, from him to his. Remember I said that, 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 what did I say? My gosh, I get so ahead of myself. Sometimes when you want to yoke to him, he says, I want you to yoke to his. So, if Jesus Christ stepped up and stepped into your burden, 
does it surprise you that Galatians 6, 2 says that fulfilling the law of Christ happens only in bearing one another's burdens, right? That's what the Bible says. See, Jesus did it, right? He, he bared your burden on the cross, remember? Didn't we, we just spent the last 30 minutes talking about that. Jesus Christ did it. Paul in Galatians 6, 2 taught it, but then let's look at authentic Paul, right? Let's see what he does. No gap, right? What does it say in Philemon 18 and 19? Didn't he do exactly what, he, what Jesus did? Didn't he do exactly what he taught? If he owes you anything, I will pay it. I will bear his burden. This guy, Onesimus, he's in, he's a, he's a, he was a slave. How much money do you think he's got? Nothing. He, he was in prison. How much money do you think he's got? Nothing. He's not, he's not, a work, he's not on a work release program when he, he gets to intern somewhere, make a few bucks on the side. He's a slave, a runaway slave, and he's in prison. He's got no money, and Paul knows this. And so Paul steps up and steps in to bear his burden. If he owes you anything, Philemon, I, Paul, will pay it. That's what a real Christian does. That's what a real Christian. Listen, you guys, you guys know um, Stephen Furtick from Elevation Church. Anyone ever hear of him? He's a good preacher, and he gets pretty fired up. I like watching him, but uh, he's got, he got a lot of good quotes. This isn't one of them. This is his wife's quote. It was Holly, and she said that one day, and it impacted my wife and I greatly, and it has lasting impact on us. She said, you be Jesus, and let God be God. I don't know if you all understand that, but see, God, God is going to build his church, and, and God is going to cause people to feel a certain way, and he's going to give you the will and the desire to do things, and and he's going to build the fruit of the Spirit in you. And he's going to give you boldness to preach the gospel when maybe you were kind of shy before. Like God does all this stuff. He builds his kingdom. But how does God be God? By us being Jesus. Listen, you ain't Jesus. Let's just clarify that. But listen, Jesus stepped up and stepped into people's burdens, right? And the Bible says that he has died rose again and ascended to heaven, but sent his spirit to live in you, right? Do you understand this? And when you said yes and you, get, and you bowed your knee to Jesus that first day, Ephesians 1.13 says that he gave you his Holy Spirit. So Jesus Christ is living inside of you, and that's all he's asking you to do is to die and let him live his life out through your body. That's what he's asking. That's, that's what Christianity really is. You die, Jesus lives, except he looks like you. That's what's supposed to happen. God builds his church on you acting like his son. In other words, even deeper, you dying of yourself and letting his life live out through you. Bearing each other's burdens. Isn't this what Jesus did? Isn't that what Jesus does? And so isn't that what we're supposed to do? That's how we fulfill the full law of Christ is by... Bearing the burdens of another. So we talked about way up high. Now we're in the low. How do we do this? How, does, what, how, how do we go about this? All right, preacher, good. Awesome. Great advice. We're supposed to be like Jesus. Share each other's burdens. How do we do that? Hebrews 12, 15 says this. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. What I got out of this, I don't know what you got out of it, but I wrote in my notes that the Christian life is active, not passive. That, 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 that it says to look after each other. Look after one another. Like, be looking. Don't just be lounging around waiting for something to happen, right? Be looking. Be active. Because God's, we all, who wants God's grace? I want God's grace. Right? We all want God's grace, but, but the Bible's saying God's grace will come, but look after each other so that no one fails to receive it. Wait a minute now. God's grace comes from heaven. Yeah, through you, because guess what? Wherever you are, there's a piece of heaven walking around inside of you. And so when you're going to yoke up with him, a lot of times, most of the time, it's to yoke up with his. Because, because, because we're all sitting around, we're, we're crying and moaning, and oh God, 
please help me. And, oh, God, provide for me. And you said if I'm tired and carry heavy burdens to come to you and you'll give me rest. And he's like, yo, dude, quit hollering and quit screaming. I'm sitting right next to you. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look next to you. You see somebody next to you? Yeah, he's like, yeah, every good and perfect gift comes from me, right? Yeah, that guy next to you, you know the paycheck that I allowed him to get this week? That gas money you need, it's in that check. Oh, and, and you know that uh, extra bedroom that you have? There's someone in your church that's sitting there going, I need a place to live. You know that extra bedroom that I gave you that you're not using except for your dog? There's someone who needs a place to live. So I, I'm a good gift giver. I gave you an extra bedroom because they need a place to live. Is my preaching getting to you yet? <laughs> In the book of Acts, chapter 2, which we talk about all the time, nobody needed for nothing because they shared everything. Oh, you got an extra bedroom? See, my wife and I, we, 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 got, a, we, got, we got extra bedrooms, and we got people living in our house all the time. <clears throat> Sometimes it's inconvenient. You know, she likes to walk around. No, I'm just kidding. But sometimes it's inconvenient, right? But you open up, the, you open up your house to people that you love. That's what you do. If someone owes, I'll pay it. See, sometimes you're the yoke that Jesus uses to help somebody carry a heavy load. See, a real Christian shares the burdens of other brothers and sisters in Christ. Listen, we need one another. We need one another. See, God told Abraham, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bless you so you could what? Be rich? To be a blessing. He didn't say, I'm going to fill your pockets with gold so you can walk around and go, ha ha, I'm loaded. He, he, he gave, filled your pockets with gold so you could walk it along and go, hey, Paula, you need some? Hey, man, you, James, wasn't it James? James, you need some? How about you, Tori? You need something? He didn't fill your pockets so you could be rich. He filled your pockets to help people. I'll bless you so you could be a blessing. That's way, 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 way back in Genesis. I don't even know how long ago. That was a long time ago. But I'll just tell you this. I think that oftentimes your blessing is waiting on you to be one. That's the problem. Your blessing is waiting. The windows of heaven are, are, are just itching to open up. And he's like, if you just do something with what I already gave you, I'll give you more. But sometimes we just stubborn. And listen, you don't change. People don't change. Seasons change. Right? No. But, but, but God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? So in Genesis, way back, he says, Abraham, I'll bless you so you could be a blessing. Is that still the same today? Well, I invite you to investigate that on your own. Don't just trust the words of an old car salesman. Guilty as charged. Open your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and look. Let's read a little God's Word together. can't get that sound on a tablet. Second Corinthians chapter 9. Let's just see what God has to say about this blessing you to be a blessing. Because we all, but not, how many people are, agree we're not living in the, in the old, old days of Genesis under the law, right? We live in the New Testament. Woo! Right? Grace. Grace abounds. Woo! I agree. Talking about giving here. We're going to have an opportunity to give here in just a few minutes. Hope you all are excited about that. Don't be bringing your limp cow with a tail grown out of his head to this offering basket. Bring your best to the Lord. Your best. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. Right? Isn't that why we pray before we do our offering here? So God can speak to your heart. Get a little quiet. Well, Grandma told me I had to give 10%. Well, she's not here anymore, and it's not her money. It's yours, and God said you should decide. 
So you get quiet and you ask him, you pray about everything, and he'll tell you what to do. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. Man, we should be having fun when we have the offering. We get all quiet up in here when we do the offering. I think that's kind of lame. Let's just show you. We were going to get quiet too here tonight. Let's, let's do something different. Play something funky up there when you get back up here. Is that cool? Play something silly. Right? He wants a cheerful giver. We don't have to get all somber. Oh, this is really going to be painful. I don't, I don't want to give this money to you, Lord, but if I don't, the pastor's looking at me right now, and I know he's keeping account. He, he, it says we should give cheerfully. It should be like a party. Right? How many people go to a birthday party, and they bring presents in? Oh, yeah. Here, this is what I got you this week for your birthday. Well, you go in, right? You're having a party. Have some parties. Have, put a pinata up or something. I'm getting way off course. Those people watching are going, I'm never watching this church again. Y'all can give online. <laughs> um, go to revolutionchurch.cc, click live. Give you a best offering. And God, listen, okay, listen. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully, and God will, is that a promise? From who? From God. Is that a promise from me? No. Is that a promise from Marie? No. How about Susan? No, man. It's a promise of the creator, the one who spoke and planets came out of his mouth. He says, and if you give cheerfully, God will generously provide all you need. How many people need something? Well, he's telling you right now how to get it. So there's no <laughs> excuse. Don't walk out of here going, man, I'm so stinking poor, I can't stand it. It says right here, he will provide all you need if you give cheerfully and give according to what he says to give. And then, watch, then you will always have everything you need. Why? And we could stop it right there, right? Woo, we have everything we need. My pockets are filled with gold. Remember Abraham? No. He'll give you everything you need. And plenty left over to share with others. You know how many people knock on this door in this church every single week looking for help? I'm just, the rubber meets the road right here right now. Just being honest with you guys, I have to constantly tell people no. Guess what? Because y'all ain't giving enough. I'm just telling you the truth, right? It, you can't give what you can't, what you don't have, right? Can't give what you don't get. So I'm not like begging you. I'm not, I'm not that, I'm not Jesse Duplantis now looking for a plane. I'll drive my car for the rest of my life. You don't have to give me a raise ever. I'm just telling you, if people come in and they need some help, I can only give them what we get. But he says, if you'll give according to what I put in your heart to give and you do it cheerfully, I'll provide everything that you need and everything plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. He's going to bless you and then he's going to inspire you with what he blesses to give and help other people. That's what he wants to do. Listen, yes, you will be enriched in every way. Not just find, see, a lot of people think, I, if, you know, you see it on TV. If you give $50, God will give you 100 right? That's not what I'm talking about. S sometimes when you give, what, is this, what does it say here? Like, not, not, this is just, this is what the Word of God says. Yes, giving generously, cheerfully, according to what God tells you to give. Yes, you will be enriched in every way. In every way. Some people in this room have found the joy in the offering, not the pain anymore. The more painful it is, the more joyful it is because you know you're helping more people. You're advancing the gospel further, and it brings you great joy. You're enriched, not because he gave you more money back, but because your church's mission advanced, and you saw people come and give their life to Christ, and their eternity was changed because of what you gave. That's why. You'll be enriched in every way so you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. I make sure, I just want to tell you all know, to know this. When someone comes into this church and asks for help and we give it to them, you know their normal, their, their normal reflex. What is it? Oh, thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. 
I just want you to know right now, anytime that happens, I reflect it. Whoa, 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 whoa. I'm like, no, 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 no. You don't have to thank me. You need to thank Jesus. It's his money. It's his people who gave it. I didn't, I, I don't have nothing. I never, I don't have anything. I tell people, we filled up someone's gas tank a couple weeks back, and I'm like, this guy's homeless, living in his car. I'm like, dude, you have more money than me. Like, for real, he had more money than I did. But I gave him some money off of our church's card to get gas for him and his family so he could go to work. And I was like, no, God did this for you. God did this for you. So he, glory to God. So it says here, so two good things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met. So the needs of people will be met. And they will joyfully express their thanks to God. As a result of your ministry of giving, they will give glory to God. For your generosity to them and to all believers will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. Whew. Come on, guys. We're going to have some fun. While they're coming up here and getting ready, I just want to close this way. And I don't want anybody to leave the room. We're going we're gonna to bring, we're not going to bring our limp cows to the Lord. We're going to bring our best to the Lord, right? Amen? Come on now. But I just want to say this. A real Christian isn't stingy. They're not some stingy dude walking around quoting Bible verses. No, that's the guy you want to punch in the face, okay? That's not a real Christian. No, a real Christian is one who's looking to be a blessing, a real Christian is one who's looking to make sure that nobody around them, see, God places you into, into positions, right? In, into neighborhoods, into families, into jobs, into churches, onto sports teams, into gym memberships. Like, he places you in these places, and he wants to make sure that you keep an eye on those people so none of them will fail to receive the grace of God. And a real Christian is looking to share looking to, sh- to, to bear another's burdens. Listen, a real Christian doesn't wait on someone to ask him. No, he's asking for someone to wait on. You see the difference? 